Okay, hello everybody. Um, welcome to the summer series. They're called Grand Rounds because at the same time as Grand Rounds, they're actually not Grand Rounds, they're the <laughs> resident didactics expanded to include the faculty, so they're in the time of Grand Rounds during the summer, and so they're the summer series, and we have a lot of exciting speakers coming up. Today, we have Dr. Tershwell um, starting up the summer series with the nuts and bolts of um, uh, stroke workup for all of us to be reminded of. Um, Dr. Tershwell doesn't really need introduction, but is the director of our stroke center. The, um, uh, I think a, a co-PI on many, I mean relevant to this, stroke-related um, research studies, including the PI of the uh, NIH, local PI of the NIH stroke net, um, and so knows everything about stroke. Welcome. Thank you, Claire, for that grandiose exaggeration. It's a good start. Um, so, yes, today is Theoretically, a talk aimed at the residents, I'm going to be focusing, as you can see, uh, mostly on how we care for stroke here at the UW. I've made uh, this top part here uh, size relevant to the amount of time I'll be spending on the different topics. So I'll be spending most of the time talking about ischemic stroke um, and its acute evaluation and treatment. A little bit of time talking about intraparenchymal hemorrhage, and I listed subarachnoid hemorrhage, but in fact, I won't be talking about that at all. Um, that's really the purview um, of the neurosurgeons, and I already have too much to talk about anyhow. Uh, briefly at the end, I'll, I'll go over some other treatments and some stroke QI stuff, divert a little bit into how things might be a little bit different at the UW as opposed to at Harborview mention the stroke phone and encourage you to use it and briefly review some stroke research studies. So let's get started. I, uh, I have a little bit of background in epidemiology as well, so I always like to start with some data and some facts about stroke. 15 million strokes per year worldwide, 5 million die, and it is the second leading cause of death on the planet, number two. Um, only behind diseases uh, of the heart and cardiac disease. Um, five million people are permanently disabled each year from stroke. Some global patterns include the fact that the incidence of stroke, so sort of the age-specific rate of stroke, is decreasing in most high-income countries, has been for a while, but because everybody's living longer, the absolute number of stroke cases continues to increase. The decreasing incidence is probably related to better blood pressure treatment and less smoking. So growth industry for those of you interested in stroke. In the U.S., almost 800,000 newer recurrent strokes per year. Here, um, it's only the fifth leading cause of death, so we've done a great job um, taking better care of our stroke patients. and mostly because women live longer than men. In absolute terms, women are actually having more strokes than men. So these are some data I was able to pull off of the CDC website just a few days ago, and it shows age-adjusted stroke mortality for 2013 through 14. And you can see that Washington State up here is a little bit on the lower end, not the absolute lowest rates, but pretty good. And the highest rates, of course, are in the southeast United States, where there's this traditional stroke belt, they call it. And then drilling down a little bit more, you can see that age-adjusted stroke mortality over the last 15 years in Washington State has almost halved, which is a pretty amazing testimony, I think, to just good medical care related to stroke. I'd like to uh, uh, be able to blame uh, TPA or something like that, but I'm dubious that that's the big factor. I think it's probably stroke units and the organization of stroke care that's really occurred over the last 15 to 20 years. And David, this is all stroke, ischemic and Yep, that's right. National death certificate data. Or here it's just Washington State. 
So this is old data, but it gives you a good overview of the general distribution of stroke in our population here in the U.S. The vast majority is ischemic stroke, almost 85 plus percent, then intracerebral hemorrhage, 10 to 15 percent, and subarachnoid hemorrhage, around 5 percent. Contrast that to the breakdown of patients that we see at Harborview, which is where we care for most of our stroke patients in this system, because we get a referral uh, base of very sick stroke patients, we have a vast overrepresentation of our hemorrhages, 20% subarachnoid hemorrhages, about a quarter intraparenchymal hemorrhages, and only about half our ischemic stroke as opposed to 85%. There's a few TIAs as well. We see more than that, but I don't think they count as admissions uh, in many cases, so they're not reflected in these data. So some of you, and hopefully all of you soon, uh, may have seen this document, which is available on the internet at all times at that web address, which should be pretty easy to remember. Um, it's something I think is worth going through a little bit just because it gives you a, a really good framework about the acute evaluation of uh, stroke patients, and it's going to be how we kind of walk through the acute care uh, today. There are sections that refer to the initial treatment in the emergency department and stroke codes. Then there's imaging, and then sort of depending on what the imaging shows, intraparenchymal hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage, IVTPA, and endovascular thrombectomy candidates. So let's, let's just kind of dive in and, and go through it. So to put this in the context of a case, 75-year-old woman presents to the emergency department with a sudden onset of significant right hemiparesis and aphasia. Could be a stroke. So uh, we're back to that top part of our algorithm. And if the patient's symptoms were less than six hours in duration, or if you suspect it's posterior circulation and a little bit longer time window, the ED would call what's called a, a code stroke. And they do that at Harborview, at least, by dialing 222, they say there's a code stroke. They give the operator the patient's medical record number, if we have it, and the patient's location. And all of you that are uh, sort of more than, uh, spent more than a day or two at Harborview are familiar with getting those uh, code stroke pages. Um, it translates actually pretty well because if there's an inpatient that's having a code stroke, you'll notice that it's the inpatient location, 5 East, uh, 4 West. And so it tells you where to go exactly. And, and really, for the residents, getting that page doesn't lead to any telephone calls. It leads to a trip to the location specified uh, on the pager, uh, preferably immediately. So uh, if you're lucky, the emergency department has had pre-notification that that patient is coming in. And so they might have called the stroke code a few minutes before the patient arrived. So you then get to meet the patient uh, at the emergency room door optimally. And with the emergency department team, you're then taking a short history and physical, uh, especially if the patient's conscious, uh, focusing on trying to start an NIH stroke scale um, evaluation. And then again, optimally, you're going directly from the door of the emergency department to the CT scanner. Um, in parallel with you doing your history and brief physical, other people are help moving the patient to the scanner, drawing some blood, uh, checking a finger stick blood glucose, perhaps getting an estimated weight uh, on the patient, and then um, you're moving sort of uh, immediately to get that uh, non-contrast uh, and uh, eventually contrast head CT scan. Is, that, is the CAT scan in the ER? There are three CAT scanners in the emergency room at Harborview, uh, including a really fancy new one that takes like no, you know, takes a lot more time to get on the table than to actually do the CT scan. Um, here at the UW, that is not the case. And although I think there is one CT scanner that's closer to the ER, that's not often the one that's used. So it can be a little bit of uh, more of a discovery process to figure out where the acute stroke code patient is if they've moved them rapidly from the ED front door here at the UW to the scanner. Sometimes the resident goes to the ED and then has to go to the scanner, and it's a little trickier. So this is a graphic that 
shows a flow for the stroke code, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I only wanted to point out that when you when a stroke code is called, the page goes out to all these different uh, people, um, including the ED uh, folks who already know it because they're calling it, but also the stroke attending who's carrying the stroke phone and the neurology resident, but also the page goes to the interventionalist, CT techs, angiotechs, pharmacy, anesthesia, um, radiology, nursing, stat nurses, so a lot of people get notified simultaneously, and that really helps expedite the initial phases of the evaluation. And we'll talk about the different pathways that people uh, get evaluated as we go th a little bit further through our algorithm. So here's the algorithm again. Now we're down here, which is the imaging part. And let me just pause for a moment to talk about acute stroke initial imaging. Non-contrast head CT is always the first and uh, most important part of that initial imaging, it's fast, requires little patient cooperation, makes that, you know, really big point of differentiation, a hemorrhage or not, and it's really all that you need to make your decision for intravenous TPA. You don't need anything really besides that, at least imaging-wise, you don't need anything besides that non-contrast head CT. Aspect scoring, which I'll explain in a few minutes, is a way to look for early ischemic changes, and we'll use that for decisions about eligibility for endovascular thrombectomy. CT angiogram almost always follows a non-contrast head CT for our acute stroke patients. If the non-contrast CT does not show blood, we're suspicious of an ischemic stroke, we get a CTA of the neck, which is really the neck and the head. Neck is code work for neck and head. Um, whereas uh, if there is blood, it's just a CTA of the head. Um, also fast and relatively easy, can identify a bunch of different things, including a proximal artery occlusion if it's an ischemic stroke, uh, which can identify a thrombectomy candidate. Uh, for the hemorrhages, you can identify aneurysms, AVMs, and even the fact that there's ongoing bleeding, which might lead to some more aggressive treatments and it overall can give you some early clues to pathophysiology. Perfusion imaging, which is of course only relevant really for ischemic stroke patients, is something that we're really still developing. We're not, we're not getting CT perfusion on all of our patients. Uh, we are supposed to be getting <clears throat> multi-phase CTA on our acute ischemic stroke patients, which gives you a better sense of collateral blood flow which can help in decision making a little bit, but those are really still evolving technologies for us at least. So anyway, here's the blow up from the algorithm. Uh, hopefully, optimally, the radiology resident, the emergency room resident, and the neurology resident are all in the CT scanner standing behind the CT tech, watching those images scroll off the screen. Blood, if there, is there blood on the head CT scan? As I said, that's a big branch point. Here our goal, and this was a while ago, was to determine this by 30 minutes from arrival, but I'll show you we're often doing that in 10 or 15 minutes. Yes, blood, then you're doing the CTA head. No blood, CTA neck, and I've got to correct my algorithm because now it's so fast it goes all the way up through the vertex, not through just the circle of Willis. So let's take, for example, that this first case that showed intraparenchymal hemorrhage. We bounce over to this part of our algorithm, the neurology resident, after they've had a chance to complete at least their initial evaluation of the patient, will connect with uh, the, the attending or fellow that's on the stroke phone to discuss the case. And I've blocked out the number here. Um, you all know how to contact us on the stroke phone. Depending on what is found, uh, the neurology team may consult neurosurgery if, it's, if there's severe mass effect. If it's a low bar hemorrhage, sometimes they're more likely to consider surgery. If there's hydrocephalus, a cerebellar hemorrhage, comorbid subarachnoid hemorrhage, they tend to be more aggressive about. Optimally for a joint, although more, more likely a sequential set of discussions uh, with the family about the indications for surgery. Um, there are specific order sets in, um, in ORCA for admitting intraparenchymal hemorrhages uh, to the hospital. Most often you're using 
the NICU uh, IPH order set, um, but there is a floor order set for transfers out of the ICU to the floor. All stroke patients get a swallow screen before anything goes in their mouth. These days, we're controlling blood pressure in these intraparenchymal hemorrhage patients to a goal of systolic less than 160. And there really haven't been any successful trials to suggest otherwise. There was recently a negative trial looking at even more aggressive blood pressure goals than this, but it didn't show benefit. And then um, you should always review the guide for reversing coagulopathies, mostly related to oral anticoagulation, and I'll comment in a moment about that. And uh, because we co-manage all of our patients in the ICU, you would admit them to the neurology service, but also the neurocritical care service is co-managing and admitting as well. So this, these are the five pages from the online guidelines for reversing coagulopathies. And I'll just comment, I forgot to note that on the algorithm, all these blue links are sort of live hyperlinks that take you to other PDF documents that give you more information. So even though the overall algorithm is just this one sheet, there's a lot of depth to it, a lot of other information you can get to. So if you click here, you end up in this document, which is a PDF, five pages, and Dr. Kreutzfeld has, has been um, uh, guiding it through multiple changes over the years. It also has these two uh, flow sheets for reversal of warfarin or the other um, oral anticoagulants. And there's also a I think it's a part of the emergency department stroke power plan that has a power plan for reversing coagulopathies. So you may want to collaborate with your ED docs who can order some of the things if you think they're needed. So then focusing on intracerebral or intraparenchymal hemorrhage, there's a new guideline. Again, it's linked to from our stroke algorithm that just came out last year. These are recommendations that have the highest level of evidence for all intracerebral hemorrhage patients, reversal of antithrombotics. And I will note that it's really anticoagulants these days because there was just a small randomized trial published showing that giving platelets to people who are on antiplatelet agents does not seem to benefit them in terms of outcome. In fact, there was a suggestion that there might even be a little bit of harm. Nobody really understands why necessarily, but we've been giving platelets for years to pe these people, um, and we probably don't need to do that anymore. So that's a new change. They're admitted to the ICU, the neuro ICU at our place. Lowering blood pressure to 140 may be safe, but it's not necessarily more effective than 160, which is our goal. Surgery for cerebellar hemorrhages with hydrocephalus, and they generally sort of recommend that you get ventriculostomy and de posterior decompression. Treat seizures with antiepileptics. DVT prevention with SCDs initially, and then eventually we change over to sub-Q heparin, usually around 48 hours. Again, swallow screens for everybody, normal glycemia, and access to rehab. Do you give any epileptic even though there's not been a seizure? So that is not on this slide because it's not at the highest levels of evidence, and um, that is sort of a uh, judgment-based thing. I would say that our practice is to not give anti-epileptics in general unless we've seen seizures. So, okay, changing the, oh no, this is the same exact history. <laughs> We're back in the scanner. This time there is no blood, and it turns out the time that this patient was last seen normal was less than four hours and 15 minutes ago. So we are the residents are immediately thinking, you know, oh, this is an IV TPA candidate. I got to do this fast because everybody's obsessing that these patients have to get their TPA quick. We want to do it quick, but of course we want to do it right. So if your initial history and physical don't show any red flags, it really looks like a stroke. Um, the CT is negative. Before you even call the stroke attending and just as they're getting started with the CTA, you should order the TPA. TPA takes 15 to 20 minutes to show up at the patient's bedside. A lot of other stuff will have happened by then. You will have had a chance to discuss the case with the stroke attending. Um, 
You'll probably have your CTA done by then as well. You'll have more information about whether there's a large artery occlusion as well. So it's very important to order the TPA early. If you're lucky, there might be an ED doc standing next to you that can do that for you while you're doing some other stuff. So take advantage of usually the large group of people that are standing around. There is an information form that I don't think anybody uses. Um, I would actually suggest that you read it once or twice because when you're talking to families, it gives you some really simple language that a bunch of fairly intelligent neurologists have reviewed ahead of time about how to talk to people about risks and benefits of TPA. Um, take a look at it at least once. There's a whole list of inclusion and exclusion criteria. Obviously, you want to go through that carefully, but quickly. Confirm it all with the uh, stroke attending, and if they qualify, you want to start that TPA as soon as possible. These patients need ICU admission for at least 24 hours. There's another protocol you can link to if you're worried about a hemorrhage after TPA. The main point being, if you're worried there's a hemorrhage, stop the TPA and scan them again real quick. There are some guidelines for blood pressure treatment. We have a lower uh, target after IV TPA. And again, there's a special order set that helps you remember all these different little things um, that's pre-organized um, um, specifically for patients that have gotten TPA. The information form comes up with the drug? Nope. The information form is out there on the internet. The inf I mean, if you wanted to be effective in using the information form, you would want to give it to the family as early as possible. But in reality, number one, uh, sometimes there isn't anybody to talk to, so that's a problem, and we still give TPA as a standard of care these days. And if there is somebody to talk to, hopefully you've contacted, you've started the discussion with them even before the TPA shows up at the bedside, so it would be better to have the information form a little bit more handy. But they don't have to sign a consent for that? They don't. I think it's optimal to consent the patient and or their family and document your conversation and that they agreed to treatment. But again, given the high level of evidence, if that's not possible, you can proceed uh, as a standard of care. And that, the AAM has changed its uh, guideline. On, on 15 years ago, the, the guideline required signing Great. <clears throat> so this graphic is just to remind everybody why we want to go as fast as is reasonably possible from the front door to when we push the button on the IV TPA pump. The benefit from IV TPA um, is really very dependent on time and decreases continuously between the one and five hour mark. Right now we're giving IV TPA, IV TPA out to about four and a half hours, because that's really where the best evidence is. So again, time is brain. Uh, try to do your best. These are some, some goals that were set out by the Heart and Stroke Association a few years ago for acute ischemic stroke treatment, and actually they've recently ratcheted them down a little bit. But for acute stroke, door to physician, 10 minutes, and like I said, we like to meet them at the door, so we like to do that in zero minutes. Door to stroke team, same thing, zero minutes. Door to CT, I'll show you some data in a second that shows we're doing way better than 25 minutes. And of course, in our system, you know, due to the, the, the great benefit of having residents in-house all the time, um, you know, the door to CT interpretation is it's sort of real time. We're not waiting for some guy in Australia to look at our films and call us back and tell us that it looks pretty normal, let alone the fact that our residents could probably interpret them mostly on their own. Door to drug, more than 80% compliance, less than 60 minutes. And I think in cases where things are pretty clear cut, we do that very consistently, but we tend to attract the complicated cases, so um, it's always a struggle. And then door to stroke unit admission, honestly, we don't track that particular nugget as carefully. So this is QI data that I've been given permission by the highest powers in the QI world to show on the internet um, because it's good data. And what it shows you 
is um, the median on the y-axis on the left, which is what these lines refer to, the median time from ED arrival to CT scan start. And the dark blue line is the cases where we did an intervention, and the light blue line is all of our stroke code cases. And you can see that over the last two years or so, we've gone from averages of 18 and 27 minutes down to now uh, an average um, door to CT time of eight minutes for the intervention cases and nine minutes for really on average for all of our stroke codes, which was 63 in the second quarter of 2016. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> Checks in the mail. Um, so um, all of this stuff that I've been talking about, and there's been a huge uptake of collaboration with the emergency department at Harborview has really paid off in improving uh, these door to CT times and the alacrity uh, of the evaluation process, I think, to the benefit of our patients. So that's, that's really good news. So let's modify our case a little bit. Yeah. The time from that to interpretation is how long? Well, so that's the, that's the weird thing about us is that you know, the interpretation is not like a discrete and separate process. More often than not, the residents are literally in the CT scanner, standing behind that, you know, thick glass window, watching the images as they come off. So it's within probably 10 minutes of when the CT starts, is what I would say. Sorry? And, you know, optimally, the radiology resident is there. That's not 100% uh, effective. Uh, or 100% or consistent. Um, so it's really pretty quick. And actually there's been all sorts of suggestions that we're supposed to document the time of the official interpretation, uh, which is, would be a real pain in the neck for us, quite honestly. And the reality is we've already acted on the scan probably way before anybody could do um, an uh, official interpretation. So. Again, it's the luxury of having residents uh, in-house uh, staring at these things that allows us to do some of these parts a little quicker. An official interpretation would require the attendant to sign off, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, I guess it would. I mean, the resident puts in a, at least yeah. a preliminary one, um, and they can date that. And, and definitely, there's lots of actions being taken based on resident x-rays in the emergency department. Um, so let's modify our history a little bit further. Um, our patient is a 71-year-old woman. She's got a fib. She had a previous stroke and got TPA, did great, no residua. But she was having trouble keeping her INR study, so she was put on one of the newer oral anticoagulants. But they are expensive. So she was off it for a few months for financial reasons. reasons. Presented to the outside hospital with right-sided weakness and dysarthria. As described, her stroke scale score was 13, which is kind of a moderate stroke. And the outside CTA showed a middle cerebral artery occlusion. And because they thought she was on the new oral anticoagulant, that's an exclusionary criteria for IV TPA, she was transferred up to Harborview for possible thrombectomy. And this is a CT scan. Um, showing the middle cerebral artery occlusion, and it may actually be from her case, I think. Um, here we're back to our algorithm, and so there was no blood. Time last normal was less than four hours and 15 minutes ago, but she wasn't eligible for IV TPA. So then we come back out here, large artery occlusion, and last time normal to HMC arrival less than five hours ago, and Actually, we probably should talk about whether that's the right thing to be in that box anymore. Um, five hours to arrival is probably reasonable because, as you'll see in a moment, door to, excuse me, uh, last normal to groin puncture for mechanical thrombectomy, we're supposed to use a six-hour uh, time limit for that intervention. And, of course, basal artery occlusions, all bets are off. We're not nearly as time-based as we are clinically-based. And if you haven't been comatose nor quadriplegic for three hours, so if you are one of those and it's been less than three hours, or you're neither of those clinically, 
there's to some degree no time limit on when we might consider intervening for a basal or artery occlusion. So anyway, if you've got a large artery occlusion, this patient has a middle cerebral artery occlusion, the answer is yes. There may be an endovascular uh, candidate you would call the stroke phone. In reality, the majority of our endovascular cases are actually patients that are referred from other hospitals. So we're often already suspicious uh, of the fact or we actually know that they have a proximal artery occlusion. So in fact, the stroke phone attending may know about it before the resident. Um, and so calling them, uh, it depends on the order of things. Obviously, very early on, we're engaging the on-call neurointerventional team. There's another information form for these patients. Again, I encourage you to read it in case you need to talk to families, although in fact, it's the interventional team that does the consenting for this procedure. There's inclusion and exclusion criteria you should also be familiar with. If they qualify, they get consented and treated. So let's talk for a moment or two about thrombectomy candidates. And these are new guidelines just published last year um, uh, in the journal Stroke uh, in the wake of these five or six randomized trials, all of which supported the effectiveness of endovascular thrombectomy for acute ischemic stroke. And these were the characteristics that were most consistent throughout those trials. And thus, these are thought to be the best thrombectomy candidates. Um, if you were in good shape beforehand, so a pre-stroke modified Rankin scale of zero to one, if you are having an ischemic stroke, you have to have that. And you already got TPA because most of the patients in those uh, in the in the trials, got IV TPA before mechanical thrombectomy. You have to have an occlusion of the internal carotid or proximal middle cerebral artery. Be over 18. Have a stroke scale score greater than or equal to six. An aspect score also greater than or equal to six, and be able to do that groin puncture as I mentioned within six hours. So. What is an aspect score? Hopefully, most of you have actually heard of this uh, by now, but maybe not everyone. Eric? Before you do that, yeah. Can you go back two slides? There. You have large artery occlusion, but you also have posterior circulation large artery occlusion. But that wasn't, I thought, what we could do with thrombectomy. How did we enter So the evidence in the randomized trials is all about anterior circulation. That is absolutely true. Um, I, as I mentioned and blabbered about, the basal or artery, because the prognosis is often so poor, we will often consider doing that on a less well evidence-based um, platform. And uh, again, in the basal or artery, again, it, the time limits are not as clear either. I would have to say I don't remember ever having gone after a posterior cerebral artery, or for that matter, even a vertebral artery if the other one is open and the basilar artery is open. So it's really mostly about the basilar artery occlusions. I thought you maybe you were talking about interarterial TPA by basilar past six hours, but you're talking about thrombectomy. It's all about thrombectomy these days. Intraarterial TPA is, is kind of passe, I would have to say, I would have to say with, and now I'm rhyming, so it's a bad sign. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, it's mostly thrombectomy. And I mean, the good thing about that is that obviously your hemorrhagic complication risk is uh, relatively decreased. So we like that. So anyway, these are the best candidates. This is the ASPECT scoring system, the Alberta Stroke Program Early CT Score. It's a reproducible grading system to look at early ischemic changes on a plain old non-contrast head CT. It's really about acute ischemic stroke of the anterior circulation. It's been shown to be simple and reliable, although I have to say that's not necessarily been my experience. It is simple, but you know you get a lot of different opinions. And it's been used in a lot of the recent trials as an entry criteria. So this is how it works. It's a 10-point grading scale. Um, you start with 10. 10 is normal. Zero means you have lots. You essentially, your whole hemisphere looks ischemic. Um, to compute it, basically one point is subtracted for each of these 10 regions. So there's a number of deeper regions, caudate, insular ribbon, internal capsule, lentiform nucleus, and then there's six different 
uh, territories in the middle cerebral artery, some further down and then some a bit more superior. Um, this is a website where you can do some training and look at some images and get a feel for how this really works. Um, I think, you know, it is useful. This is a picture that just shows you the different regions. It's a little hard to see, uh, but I think you can see the 10 different regions. Here are the higher middle cerebral artery territories. Here are the lower ones. And then here are some of the deeper areas and the insula here. So here is our case. Pre-notification was uh, in place, so the Harborview stroke team was waiting for her at the door. She arrived at Harborview. It was three and a half hours from the onset of her symptoms. Um, her NIH stroke scale score was 11, so it was a little better. She had right hemiparesis, facial droop, diminished sensation, dysarthria, and a little bit of aphasia. And here was her non-contrast head CT. What was the aspect score? Well, I'm going to tell you. So if you look here, um, this is a little bit of uh, hypodensity, probably in internal capsule. She was given a point for that. And then if you look very superficially here, um, maybe a point in this uh, distal uh, middle cerebral artery territory. So in this case, the aspects was 10 minus 2 or 8. And so you have to have more than 6 to qualify for thrombectomy. So this was OK. This was an OK scan. Um, because we were waiting for the patient and we had, you know, the, the wheels were all greased, the patient got from the front door of Harborview to her non-contrast CT to the angio suite to actual puncture in the groin with a catheter within 38 minutes, which is pretty amazing. And here's the first run on the angiogram, which shows the sharp cutoff in her uh, uh, middle cerebral artery. Um, she had uh, good... Um, and easy to navigate arteries. So the first catheters were up there just a few minutes later, and you can see that there was a fantastic angiographic result with sort of full reperfusion of her middle cerebral artery territory. Her NIH stroke scale score eventually went down to 3 to 4 from 11. Sorry about that. Apparently, Bruce and I are getting calls from the same people. <laughs> but dialed me, huh? Um, so, uh, including an immediate reduction after the procedure and eventually was discharged home. And just so you don't think everything is perfect, she did have a number of small areas of ischemia in that middle cerebral artery territory, uh, but really did well. There's lots of monitoring that goes on after IV TPA and thrombectomy. Um, uh, it's mostly the same after thrombectomy as after IV TPA, except there's additional groin, puncture, and pulse checks. This is a graphic which really just shows the time versus benefit effect, similar to IV TPA, but this is for endovascular thrombectomy from one of the trials, the absolute risk difference, so the absolute benefit of having a good modified Rankin score outcome is much higher, of course, if you're treated early uh, as opposed to later. Okay. You got a call too? All right. Um, so I showed you who were the best candidates for mechanical thrombectomy, but there's a lot of gray areas which we'll sometimes stray into on a clinical basis. Groin puncture greater than six hours occasionally, although we're especially not supposed to do that um, related to a randomized trial that we'll be participating in soon. Um, in patients with TPA contraindications, we do it. Those, those were less well represented in the trials. More distal occlusions or basilar artery, as I suggested, um, Eric, are less evidence-based, but we've definitely done it. We, we did a thrombectomy very successfully, um, and Bree was on the news for this one. Um, uh, a 17, I think she was 17 years old, who had a congenital heart thing and an embolic stroke did fantastically after thrombectomy. Um, if you weren't so good before, if you don't have such a severe stroke scale score, if your aspects is less than six, um, that's a little bit uh, debatable. Uh, and then sort of extending the time window based on advanced imaging is something that's still undergoing research. After 
You've done all of that, gotten your patient the best therapies they can. There's lots of standard stuff after admission to the hospital as well. And again, there are standardized order sets uh, for the ICU or floor that help you remember all the right things to do for your stroke patient every time. Um, and I just, I did note that this is another correction I need to make on the algorithm is add in. There is a special post-thrombectomy order set. Um, but in fact, it's turned out that it's been best for the endovascular team to put in the post-thrombectomy order set. So for the neurology residents in particular, your job is, to till, is still just to put in the ICU admit orders for ischemic stroke, and it's either with or without TPA, depending on whether or not they did or didn't get TPA. And those order sets are not really overlapping. They're separate and complementary. So any other treatments? There are a few other things to do and try to remember. We do want you to huddle with the ED nurses and doctors after stroke codes. I know that's not possible every time. I encourage you especially to engage with the ED nurses who are good at rounding up the ED docs uh, to try to get that done. Um, we are in a continuous quality improvement cycle related to our stroke codes and really need that real-time feedback. Everybody gets admitted to the NICU or Three West stroke units, um, and that's probably what's been responsible for more of the decrease in stroke mortality, I think, than anything else. We treat, we try to achieve euglycemia, but how aggressively to do that, that is the subject of an ongoing research trial as well. We do occasionally do decompressive craniectomies for more malignant strokes, either MCA, or um, cerebellar. And then we do often use fluoxetine to promote motor recovery after stroke. I forget about this still all the time. Uh, there was at least one pretty good randomized trial supporting that, and there are some other ones that are ongoing. And that's immediate? Well, you know, it doesn't have to be in the emergency department, but I think within the first few days. And I don't actually remember when they did it in the randomized trial. I could find that for you. And what's the rationale for that? Um, you know, I'm not 100% sure. There is some basic science that actually suggests that fluoxetine in particular can help with uh, neuronal uh, regeneration. Um, but also, you know, people wonder, they, they believe they proved it was separate from the just treating depression, and so they're more eager to participate in rehab. Um, so I, what? Within five to ten days. Within five to ten days, so not immediately. Um, but I'm not sure I have a really good answer for that. Because <laughs> 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 Along with the aspirin and the statin and the amlodipine. So David, let me ask you a question. Uh, yeah. Do they look, I mean, do they, uh, is there, do they collect data about what comes out with the thrombectomy procedure? You know, do they come back with a clot, or does the clot come back with nothing? Uh, um, I've heard people talk about it. Sometimes you make an effort to get something, and by the time you're up there reaching around for it, maybe you don't bring back anything. So they definitely bring back clots at times, depending on which set of devices they use. I think sometimes it ends up coming out with a suction device and then it just falls into a vat of nasty fluid and so they don't find it. Other times with these stent retrievers, they'll, you know, they'll show you a, a nasty clot and there's all sorts of pictures all over the internet of these. It strikes these. me that that would be a good thing to have a clot at the end of this procedure as opposed to have knocked that clot up into the distal circulation. Yeah. I won't argue with so, you there. Uh, so maybe uh, kind of a, a prognostic factor or something? It's interesting. I don't know that anybody's actually scientifically uh, evaluated it's that. the easiest thing you're doing. Yeah, it's interesting. I'll, I'll ask the interventionalists what they think about that. We often think about because there's different consistency, don't you? There's no calcium in one. Well, Some are firmer. They shouldn't, they shouldn't be pulling off calcium. Uh, well, I guess sometimes that's possible. Yeah, I imagine, but uh, still be interesting to get a... 
And then just to finish up, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but we collect a ton of data and Harborview and the UW commit a lot of person time to collecting quality improvement data for stroke patients. Most of these things which we're required to do are built into those order sets, so you don't have to think about it. It's kind of hardwired uh, into the system, and actually we do great on most of these measures, so thank you for filling out all those computer forms and checking those boxes. Everybody gets a stat. So that's for ischemic, some of them apply only to ischemic stroke patients. And in fact, ischemic stroke patients, um, if you have an LDL that's less than 70, that's a reasonable exclusion. There's a lot of detail not on this slide, um, which does allow for um, reasonable exclusions to almost any of these measures. So. Oh, I think that's my iPad ringing from my phone. I didn't silence the, uh, from, sorry about that here, I fight. Too much technology. Um, so I apologize, I'm a couple of minutes over, but I do want to just take a minute to talk about what's different here at the UW. You already heard about the CT scanners not being quite as conveniently located. That's a thing. Um, if you do, if somebody does come into the emergency room here and they're found to have an intracerebral subarachnoid hemorrhage, almost invariably those patients will be transferred over to Harborview to be admitted to the neuro ICU. For ischemic stroke cases, the stroke code process is really similar, except that you might have more trouble finding the patient initially if they've already gone to CT. Um, and they are doing direct door to CT if they have advanced notification here as well. If a patient looks like they're going to get IV TPA, that's definitely done here. And the same thing about calling to pharmacy and ordering it early. And then while they're, you know, whipping it all up and putting it together, you can talk to the stroke phone uh, and make that decision, try to get it done efficiently. For thrombectomy, it's sort of become clear that the interventionalists based on, I think, largely on the equipment and the infrastructure that's in place, would really like to do almost every one of these cases at Harborview. Um, the, the angio suite uh, and the personnel are just not in place here at the UW to the level that they are at Harborview, um, so they prefer to send them over. Um, I will say that there are some patients, you know, that have advanced cardiac devices or whatever that cannot leave the premises. It's just not a possibility, and there is a process in place to do what we call a level two stroke code, which is when we're going to endovascular. It can be done here. It has been done here. There have been a couple of really good outcomes, um, and we continue to work on improving those processes as well. Um, in fact, we're, we're in the middle of a cycle of improving our process for rapid transfer to Harborview as well. Well, that's on the standard process now. <laughs> <laughs> and whether it's the first step or the second step is still a little bit under debate. So then as far as the stroke phone goes, continuous coverage by a stroke neurologist, our fellows, um, will answer first at times, but certainly not always. Um, and there is always an attending on backup call that they are conferring with. Uh, our neurology residents and then other UW faculty and staff can call us directly. And we urge the residents to call. Please don't hesitate. We want to help take care of these patients as early and as, as best we can. For providers outside of the UW system, also able to consult the stroke phone, but must do through the transfer center, and that's the Husky Purple's transfer center phone number for anybody that doesn't notice it. And then uh, finally, we are involved, as Claire mentioned, in a lot of different stroke trials, um, including for acute stroke, both ischemic and intracerebral hemorrhage, as well as rehab and prevention. And I'm going to run through these really quick. The point study is minor ischemic stroke and TIA, dual versus single antiplatelet therapy. The SHINE study is looking at um, moderate ischemic strokes, intensive versus standard glycemic control to improve outcomes. The DIFFUSE 3 study, which is not quite started but will start soon, uses advanced 
uh, perfusion, diffusion, or a CT version of that, advanced imaging to try to identify appropriate candidates for endovascular thrombectomy in a six to six hour time window, excuse me, six to 16 hour time window, so a longer time window. And the Action 2 study, which also hasn't started, an industry trial looking at natalizumab uh, to interfere with the um, immune and inflammatory response post-stroke to improve outcomes. For intracerebral hemorrhage, IDEF is um, intravenous deferoxamine to chelate some iron to improve outcomes after hemorrhages. And then our subacute studies, the tele-rehab study, Steve Kramer, a former UW stroke neurologist, is the PI for this, looking at intensive in-person versus uh, remote versus via telemedicine rehabilitation uh, to improve outcomes in patients with sort of moderate um, arm dysfunction, arm and hand dysfunction after stroke. Crest 2 is um, uh, endarterectomy or stenting versus just best medical care for asymptomatic carotid stenosis. And the Navigate ESA study is our other industry trial looking at anticoagulation with a new oral anticoagulant, rivaroxaban, versus aspirin for ischemic stroke patients who don't have AFib but do have sort of a cryptogenic uh, stroke. So we're always looking for patients. We always appreciate you're thinking about whether you're the stroke patients you're taking care of might qualify for studies. And this here at the bottom is to remind me that I have, we, we had a lot of personnel out in the stroke office and we're down on creating our new sets of stroke cards. So for any residents that don't have them, I apologize. We'll try to get them to you soon. And that's it. Thanks for your attention. Any other questions I can answer for anybody? So yeah, inpatient stroke codes are, are tricky. Um, both here at the UW Medical Center and at Harborview, essentially a stroke code, it's called the same way. You dial the page operator with the 222. I don't know if it's 222 here, the way it is at Harborview. I think it is. And, you're, and, and this can be a nurse's, really anybody is empowered to call a stroke code. You give the patient's U or H number and their location that goes out to a large group of people. Again, the marching orders for the resident are you get the page, you show up at that location, and you start evaluating the patient for acute stroke. Um, getting down for an early scan is always a part of the equation. You're figuring out whether it's ischemia or not, and then you sort of filter into the same pathways that you do um, if you were coming through the emergency department. Well, you do have to go to the emergency department or to radiology to get your scans. It has been a little troublesome, as especially here at the UW, where to go after your scan while we're trying to decide what we're doing with you. And we are actively resolving that issue. Um, there's agreement from the emergency department to act as a holding uh, location, although there's been some pushback, some of the, especially for ICU patients, some of the ICU attendings feel like they should come back to the ICU, but if you then have to then go somewhere else, it's, it, it definitely gets complicated. And um, I would say that we identify a new weakness in our process every time it happens almost. And uh, some of the cases really aren't strokes. And, uh, absolutely. We find those too eventually, hopefully before we do any aggressive interventions. Um, but it is a challenge. It is a real challenge. Anything else? I have a question for um, Could we have a poster with all the settings on it? Yes. Yeah. A poster? Yeah. No problem. We'll make yeah, it happen. We'll, send out the staff poster, but, um, well, we'll just put a poster that has everything on it so you don't have to look in, at 12 posters. What's yeah. Well, so again, um, in our patients where there isn't an obviously complicating factor that slows us down, uh, we're doing very well and, and always consistently less than an hour. There was one 
that I think we're reviewing at our stroke code meeting tomorrow. There was only one in the last uh, month that I think was 43 minutes or something like that. But even that, there seemed like there were some opportunities for improvement. And I think the record is something like 28 minutes. So feel free to bust that. 24? Uh, it could be eight. So I ironic. <laughs> yeah. are, are you uh, treating intraventricular hemorrhage as an extension of ICH? Um, well, I guess it depends on how. So we have, we're not using the results of the CLEAR studies to give TPA into the ventricles. If, was that what you were at? Well, it wasn't a positive study, first of all. It's not been published. So that's a bit uh, troublesome as well. Um, and, uh, you know, honestly, um, I don't think the stroke neurologists nor the neurosurgeons have been particularly impressed that it's a miracle cure. And then finally, anecdotally, which of course is one of the most powerful influencers in medicine, we had a, a case with a horrible hemorrhage complication doing that just a couple of years ago. So other than ventriculostomy, and time, and potentially decompression if it was the right scenario, we're not treating it with TPA. Yeah, Bruce. David, yeah, great talk. Uh, Thank you. Absolutely terrific. Um, you, uh, and I say you all, the stroke docs, have done a, a lot of, uh, made a lot of effort to communicate recognition of stroke so that people in the field know enough to bring a patient uh, or themselves, in some instances, into an emergency room. Um, where are we on that curve? Do you have any sense about the frequency if you just took the norm, you know, uh, demographic information about how frequently stroke occurs and how many you're seeing uh, and others that you might have data about? How are we doing? Is this something that's going to continue to go up steadily so that uh, you're seeing Many more patients. So I, I apologize, I've not been repeating the questions. Um, Dr. Ransom asks, I think, whether more people are coming in early after their strokes. Is that a reasonable paraphrasing? Well, I, no, I, I can see that they are. The question is, how have we saturated that? Or do you think we've got the message? Well, out? honestly, I, I don't, I, I'm not even sure that a lot more people are coming in early. I think really? public education for stroke is a huge problem. And, you know, one of the things that's always worked against us is that stroke often doesn't hurt. So if there's no pain and it's just a little funny thing, you know, people go and take a nap. Um, so, uh, you know, the more severe strokes uh, obviously come in early at a much higher rate than the less severe ones, which is, you know, is appropriate. And in fact, those are the ones we're most interested in being aggressive at treating. But absolutely, we have not finished with public education surrounding stroke signs and symptoms and, you know, time is brain, call 911, the whole fast uh, thing, that's a big part of public stroke education these days. You know what fast stands for, right, Bruce? Uh, food, activity, uh, sleep. <laughs> Face, arm, speech, and time. You knew it, you were just putting us on. Anyway, any other questions? All right, thank you.